Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to welcome you here at the webinar called Introduction to High Throughput Screening. And in the first, I would like to ask you to turn off your cameras, okay? So all of you are muted, so you cannot uh, you cannot speak during the webinar. And I will I would really need if you turn off your cameras, okay? Please do it right now. Turn off your camera, okay? Otherwise, you will be recorded and you will be on the recorded version of the web webinar, okay? Hopefully, everybody hears me, okay? So, uh, my name is Shaka Shinova and I am from the Institute of Molecular Genetics in Prague, Republic, and I will be the guide during the webinar. Mm, the main speakers who will be presenting the particular topics are Francisca Vicente from Medina from Granada in Spain, Sheraz Gould from Fraunhofer Institute for Molecular Biology and Applied Ecology in Hamburg, Germany, and Pepo Brea from University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. This webinar will be, is organized as the training activity of EU Open Screen Drive project. EU OpenScreen is the European consortium of high capacity screening platforms around Europe and the DRIVE project is supporting the activity of EU OpenScreen partner sites and potential new members of EU OpenScreen consortium. On the slide, you can see the main topics of this webinar ended with a short video of high throughput screening process. You can write uh, you can write your questions during the webinar in the chat window. The questions will be answered either directly after the webinar or by email after the WebEx meeting is finished. Now I would like to invite our first speaker, Francisca Vicente, who will start with target identification and definition. Then Pepo Brea will continue and talk about compound collection. The Sheraz. Can you turn off your? Okay, sorry for that. And Sheraz, who will talk about essay optimization, primer, primer screen, and hit selection. Francesca Vicente will finish with uh, data analysis, and then we will see the short video which will be commented by Pepo and the video was prepared in uh, his place in his partner site, University of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, I, I would like to ask Francisca, please. Francisca, can you start? Yes. When? Okay, move to the first slide, please. Yeah. I'm moving, but it's slow. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, uh, hello everyone. As Marka mentioned before, uh, in, the in this course of the introduction of today's speakers, my name is Francisca Vicente. I am responsible of the screening and target validation on the Fundación Medina. The first part of this uh, HTS introduction course is uh, will be focused in the target identification and assay, and assay validation. Uh, for this purpose, uh, the first thing that we are going to describe and the first things that we are going to be uh, in detail is what is a target. Uh, the target is considered uh, as any biological and any uh, protein and any uh, gene that could be uh, used as the first tool to, to, to perform an assay and to describe an assay uh, that we want to uh, develop in the, for the future campaign of screening. Uh, we consider a target uh, that uh, should be, the target should be very important, like a, a protein, like an, a nucleic acid, carbohydrate, a lipid. That is very important to take in consideration that this target should be efficacious, safety, and meet the clinical needs when we think in develop an assay. And one of the most important taking thing to take in consideration is that this uh, target should be targetable. What means targetable? Targetable means that this is accessible for the molecular or the, or the extract or the drug that we are going to use in this screening campaign. 
and then this this molecule or this strat or this uh, drug uh, at the end could be uh, biolical, could be a small molecular, but this is should be bind with the target that we selected, and is the thing that we are going to see at the end of this target that we selected is a biological response. This biological response could be measured for different methods, but uh, it, depending on the acid that we want to, to establish, this biological response should be evaluated by in vitro or by in vivo. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. How to choose this target? Uh, now, with these two, two tools that are described in the slide, we have a lot of knowledge about the genomics, the proteomics, and also we have a very important tool that is a, a, going to be involved the other two, the genomics and proteomics, that is the bioinformatics. With these three tools, we can uh, select it, which all of the targets that we are going to use in the, in the, in the selection and to establish the assay development. Uh, the knowledge of the genomics of more of the cell lines and more of the, the uh, microanids and the parasitics give us, and also later the proteomics, uh, this was very important because opened a window for more targets that we are using the previ previously. Before, we are using a number of targets that we are very, very, very short, but with these two kinds uh, of these two tools, genomics and proteomics, the number of targets that we can use in the, in the, in the acid development is, is huge and is more than the one that maybe sometimes we can uh, uh, reach. Uh, for this, uh, in the next slide, please. Okay, for this in the next slide, uh, the first ones that we selected for the genomics, uh, proteomics, and using the bioinformatics to select it for this selection, we have to validate the target. To validate the target, uh, we can use all of the tools that are described here, but this is a step that is extremely important when we want to develop an assay. And we have to lose in this, in this step a lot of time, uh, studying the signal pathways of the target, the study if we have or is possible to have um, uh, animal models for this target, to evaluate it, the chemicals uh, and the genomics of, the, of, of this target, but uh, at the same time, uh, study all of the literature that is available about this target and also the, 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 the patents. But if anything is not available in the literature and were not previously uh, published, it's very important to work in this using these tools, using uh, immunochemistry, using Western plots, or using molecular pharmacology, in order to know before I start the campaign of the screening everything about the target. This is uh, one taking too much time, but this is going to give us a success of the campaigns of the screening that we are going to, to, to develop in the future. Uh, in the next slide is only a flavor of the, the main proteins family of, that had been used in the Sun's target. Uh, Sarka, I don't know if it's possible to put uh, in, in a full screen the slides uh, because the people is asking about this. Okay, no problem. Then, some of these uh, targets that are mentioned in these this slides are uh, no a lot for you, for you because are GPCRs, are ion channels, alkinase, are uh, uh, nuclear receptors, as things that we are using many times. And in this, in the in the in the in the top of the slide, uh, you can see the percentage of where these, these targets have been using, and also the number of small molecules that were uh, matched and were merged uh, as activities of, of, of these targets. Uh, as you can see, there are ones that were used many times and were more easy to identify his for these targets, but in other cases, it's, it's more problematic. But this is only, only an example, an example of the kind of targets. Thank you, Sarka. 
Uh, this is only a, a, an example of the of the target that we can use uh, for for develop the, the assays. And in the bottom of the slide is the percentage of, of the clinical success of these targets that had been obtained for, for, for many years, and with all of the family proteins that were uh, described and mentioned before. Uh, this gives a, a flavor of one of the things that we can be used, but in, with the genomics and the proteomics uh, uh, science that are developing and technologies that are developing this, the number of targets that we can use and the families that we can use is uh, increased a lot and is huge. This is a very good, this, this chart is from a very good uh, review the, from Nature uh, uh, Reviews uh, in, in drug discovery and it's something that we could be uh, evaluated and read in order to know more about the different targets and how this could be useful. Uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, one, now that we selected the target, we have to choose which one and to study all of the characteristics of the target. Now we are going to move uh, other steps of the high throughput screening that uh, is the first objective, is the outcome of, of the high throughput screening, is to select and to identify the hit and also I would like to mention briefly what are some things about the leads. The leads is not the objective of this HTS, initial HTS courses, because it's one of the steps, less steps in the, in the process of the high throughput screening. But I think it's very important to mention briefly this, what means leads and what is the difference between hits and leads. Uh, the hits uh, is one activity that we selected to uh, against the target that we desire and is acting against this, this target. The, the ideal is to obtain these hits a low concentration and with a lot of specificity. This could be sometimes probably, but in other cases, it's, very, it's, it's only possible to obtain potent things. But it's on, we try to de 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 develop or to perform the assay in order to catch and to manage these low uh, concentration activities. And one thing that we should consider is that it's very important and it's going to be uh, described deeper later for my colleagues is the importance to uh, in the in the screen to try to uh, use a libraries with a huge uh, diversity of components. This is give us more successful in the future screening. If we, the, the, the libraries that we are using not, doesn't have this, uh, don't have this uh, diversity, the, the probability of success is less. And also the side of these libraries on the side of these campaigns is the numbers that you see in the bottom of the slides, but uh, it depends of type of the slide that, of this asset that we are going to develop, it could be large, medium, or height. And this is, very this is according also with the characteristics of the assay, the capacity of we have to do HTS, and the cost of the assay. But this is going to give you in detail later in, in, the, in, the, in the next steps of the, of the courses. Uh, please move to the next slide. Uh, before to move to the, to the, to the to the rest of the presentation of this first part of the, the, the course, I would like to move very briefly of the terminology of the drug discovery in order to be all of us in the same, in the same picture and to be very clear this concept. These concepts are very important and everything should be understood in the same, in the same way. High throughput, I mentioned before, what it means, assay, also, it was mentioned very uh, in detail. Is is the is the the assay is the thing that we the, the develop with the biological system that we selected. The heat also is the outcome of that we obtain uh, with the most of the screenings, and is the, the could be an inhibition or activation. It depends. And the next step that is new and it's uh, the first time that I mentioned, is heat validation. Heat validation is the next step after we obtain, uh, uh, we selected the activities of the, of, of the screening, the primary screening that we are running. 
and is with the ones that we selected in the, in, the, in the first primary screening, we need to validate it. And this validation is very extremely important and is something that we also we should establish before we start with the campaign of screening. Is the validation of if the hits that we obtain should be false, positive, true, positive, and it should be validated if they are specific or not specific. Uh, this is something that uh, we should establish from the beginning. It's not it's loss of the time if only we establish the primary screening and we don't consider this kind of a secondary or this kind of screenings that gives us the functionality and, or, uh, and the value of the hits that we obtain in the primary screening. And finally, briefly, to say you that the lead identification is the next step after the height validation. And for the lead identification, the heat that we have selected in the validation should be potent, should be specific, should be selective, and should be the one that we move later for the development programs. And this is the last step is, is of the, our campaign of screening. But it's the, the, it's the objective of we have to think uh, when we establish this process of development one, one, one as it. Moving to the next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide, please. It's not working. Sorry, Francisca. No worry. No, don't worry. We can wait. Now? Okay. Okay. It's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Sarka. Uh, this now we are going first for move in three slides. The first one is the heat discovery, that is uh, the first step, uh, and after is the to mention the heat uh, uh, selection and the validation. The heat discovery, as mentioned before, is included the HTS screening that I, I, is, is, is the process that we are described previously, but it, it now in, in, this, in this slide only is mentioned two points that we are not described previously. How the screening paradise and the strategies of the screening paradise could be focus or one focus. This means that focus is when we selected one library, library that is now, and we know which, which kind of components that we are going to work. And in the case of unfocus, we don't know any, any characteristics of the chemotype of the library that we are using, and then we can identify any things. According with the HTS screening that we are going to, to develop, in this case, we, it's, it's possible to select it one, a focus strategic or unfocus strategic. But this is taking in consideration the account that we are going to select it in the, in the phase. And also is, is, is taking in consideration if the target is completely new and then we don't have any uh, uh, experience about this target and then we don't know any kind of uh, pharmacophore that maybe could be the, the match or the merge the target that we identify. And this, in this case, it's completely unfocused. But if we have some experience and then we have some kind of a, the, the experience that of type of pharmacophores or the type of chemical library that we could be the ones and specific for this target is the one that is the one that we can select it. But this is also a very important point according with the kind of target that we are selecting. Moving to the next slide, please. Okay. This uh, were mentioned before, but only to focus, to, to mention two points here the, in, in the heat identification. The heat identification is a is the system that we develop and, and is the system that we selected for determining that the compost are interact with our target. And in this case, the system that we are selecting for this heat identification is very variable. There are uh, later where you are going to see different methodologies, but these methodologies could be the, the, any molecular, uh, in, any interaction protein, any enzymatic protein, 
any readouts that give us this information, any expression of cell lines, and this, with this is very important to, for us that and very significant because if we select it very good, this tools or this argument, this, this technologies may be to avoid later to use a lot of animals in the, in the, in the, in the less state of, of the studies. And this is very important because it's safe and you know that one of the ethical process of the drug discovery is to use less animal in the studies. That is something that we cannot avoid. We can use many, many technologies to avoid to use this uh, proportion of animals, but at the end we need to do, before to go to the clinical trials, we need to do some experiments in the, in the, in the animals. In the next slide is the lead identification. I am not going to the, the characteristics that were mentioned before, but uh, once that we have I will be focused in these acronyms that is mentioned in this, this slide, that is, we selected the heat validation, and after we pass this to the lead, and should we have all of the characteristics that are mentioned in the, in the top of, uh, of the slide, but also should we have this lead, uh, um, even this lead, this compound that is considered as a lead, should we have Admit properties. What means admit properties for the people that have not familiar with this? This is a, a terminology that is used a lot in the pharmacology, in the pharmacokinetics, and the is an acronym means that means absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And when this this is very important, and we should do very early this, this determine the characteristics of the heat that we are validated very early, and in a very early stage, because this gives us a lot of information that to avoid a lot of time and to, to avoid lost a lot of time. And to pass only to the lethal optimization, the best compounds with these characteristics. And to uh, evaluate with these characteristics, we evaluated the side effects or the secondary effects that could be have these leads later in the clinical trials and to know this in the very early stage is very important because we are going to have to only to pass later in the lead optimization things that give us very few problems. Okay, next, next slide, please. With this slide, it's only summarize all of the things that we are see. We see the target in the, in the, in the drug discovery, the, the three steps that we are described previously, the target identification, the assay development, and the HTS unvalidated. And the key questions in the assay development is the ones that we are described here. All of them should be considered. Should be considered if we are going to look an inhibitor and an activator, if the target could be regulated, if the target should be measured, because if we cannot measure the function of the target, we don't have any assay in our hands. To see if it's possible to do this process in HTS, in a, in, in a medium, large or medium HTS, and also to pass to do the post HTS, that is the one that I mentioned before with the lead optimization. Um, the next slide, please. And this is, is not the last, it's the previous one, but a slide of this first part of the courses, but is. Uh, a summary of the assay development is the key consideration in the assay development. All of them were described theme before, uh, and we are mentioned and emphasized that they are very important. They are very important, robust state, reproducibility. But one of them we are not mentioned before, and it's something that we, is very important: is the cost. The cost is very important to take in consideration because not all of the assay could be run at the same in a low cost, but some ones are very expensive. But if the outcome that we are taking from them are very important in the in the evaluation of our uh, uh, target and in the evaluation of our leads, uh, maybe we should consider this not with a very um, a very large amount of components, but with some of them are very specific because maybe is the pass is the test 
and it's the process that gives us the next step to pass this to the next trial or the, to the chemical trial or to the lip optimization. But uh, it's something that we should balance according with the results that we obtain. And I would like to finish with this quality, uh, this sentence that is here, that is extremely important. To lose a lot of time to develop the asset is extremely important because this gives us later a very good results. And with these results, we could move forward. But if we do very quickly, if we develop a very quickly asset and we don't obtain very robust results or quality data, we lose the time. We lost the reliance, we lost the time, and we don't have any answer in, in our hands. Okay. Um, this next slide. The next slide is only a brief uh, uh, mention to say it, to you things that we should consider when we, are, we develop an assay. Because there are things that are very obvious, but sometimes we don't take in consideration. And these kind of causes are the causes of more of the variation of our assays. Uh, I, I, you can read that there are things that maybe is, are the son of them are silly, but sometimes created as very important problems when we develop an assay. Uh, could be in both type of phases, and but uh, ones of them are very specific for the cell-based assays, but the other ones should be only f common for border type of assays. I think taking in consideration this very normal or very obvious things are very important when we develop an assay. And with this, I think it's all of the things and the points that we want to cover with this target in the first part of the course, the target identification and assay development. And thank you so much for listening. And now I think we can move to, to the second part of the of the of the course thank you so much okay thank you francisca so i would like to ask pepo to continue pepo okay. thank you sarka uh, what i'm first of all just a brief introduction my name is pepo brea from the university of santiago de compostela and i'm the head of the high throughput screening platform of biopharma research group at this university and what i'm going to speak to you about is uh, about the, the compound collection relevance in high throughput screening. As Francisca has pointed out, uh, it's critical to have a good assay developed for having a successful high throughput screening, but it's also as critical as the assay development, the chemical library you are going to screen. And this depends on the purpose of your, of your screening. If you are looking for novel drugs, if you are thinking a drug discovery process, uh, the, the composition of this chemical library would be different for those projects that are more devoted to novel chemical probes, chemical biology process, uh, as they are the, those uh, carried out by EU open screen. On the left of the, of the slide, these are uh, a brief summary of the properties of known drugs. And as you may realize, all of them share a molecular weight around 300 and 400 more than Daltons, more or less, a seal of P around five to four, four to five, uh, around five uh, rotatable bonds, five hydrogen acceptors. These are the averages. So if you are thinking in obtaining novel drugs for a high throughput screening, your chemical library should have numbers similar to that in the, in the chemical description of your compounds. But instead, if you are looking for novel chemical probes, you can uh, not be so strict with these rules, and you can include in your chemical library another kind of products, uh, as they, they can be also natural products. On the right part of the screen is a comparison about drugs that are uh, depicted in red and natural products libraries that are depicted in green. And you may realize that the properties are quite different. So depending on the purpose of your screen, you uh, have to select the right chemical library you want to screen on that in order to have a successful high throughput screening. If you move to the next slide, please. It's, uh, it's also important to know the compounds that are composing your chemical library. 
uh, for example, uh, if there are toxic compounds there, if there are reactive compounds there, if there are unstable compounds there. So these uh, criteria that appear in this, in this table are the criteria that uh, we apply for designing the EU Open Screen Chemical Library. In order to avoid these compounds that may add interferences in the cell and that could render big numbers of false positives due to their reactive nature or due to that they are covalent binders and properties like that. You should not discard them if you are looking for chemical probes, but you should be aware of, of those compounds. Having some kind of warning or a flag of this compound that if, if it is a hit, you could think, okay, maybe this could be due to, the, to, to this chemical property. Of course, there are some other compounds that makes no sense to be included you because they are toxic for almost everything. But uh, you have to select quite uh, strictly the compounds you are going to include in your chemical library. If you move to the next slide, please. Uh, as uh, Francisca pointed out, it's also important to have a big chemical diversity in your chemical library. And this chemical diversity will Warranty or will increase your probabilities of finding hits on your when you are running your screen campaign. But sometimes the cost is a limiting factor, factor, and you are not able to screen the whole chemical library because of the, the there's a costly reagent or something with a say uh, is hampering to to run high throughput screening. So sometimes you can make subsets of your chemical library. What is in on the top left is the distribution of the chemical diversity of a chemical library uh, in, in cyan color, and in green color are representative compounds for the whole chemical diversity. So with selecting just these representative compounds, you are screening almost the whole chemical diversity on this chemical library. And these compounds are clustered based on their similarity. And this is depicted on the top right part of the slide where they, there are clusters with just one component. There are around 50 clusters, and most of the clusters have eight compounds or nine compounds or 10 compounds in there. So once you find a hit for the representative compound of each cluster, you can uh, screen the diversity around the, those compounds belonging to this cluster. And in this way, you are exploring the whole chemical diversity, but with a more rational uh, way for those costly assays. As Francisca has already pointed out, sometimes you are uh, going to run a focus screen because you know something about the target. These are directed screens where you know some properties or some compounds. So it's always useful to have also your chemical library characterized, characterized in terms of the families or targets that you may bind, as they can be GPCRs, kinases, enzymes, nuclear receptors. And in this way, if you are going to screen just a given target, you just screen this subset of your chemical library in order to, to be more efficient and okay, take into account the cost of the screening so many compounds and the results you are going to obtain. If you move to the next slide, please. Another critical point is to know the characteristics of the compounds belonging to your chemical library. That means that if you have, as an example, autofluorescent compounds, then this is in the, in the top uh, picture, where that, uh, when you excitate with a blue light and they emit in a green light, if these compounds are autofluorescent, they will render false positives due to this, to this in color. So it's always useful to have these compounds characterized by means of a bioprofiling in order to detect which compounds are autofluorescent, which compounds may form subjugations, which compounds may precipitate at a given concentration, and which compounds may interfere with ATP as an example, which is a cofactor in many assays. So if you have this bioprofiling at the beginning, once you find the, those compounds uh, on your hydrophobic identified which compounds are true positives and which compounds are false positives. As Francisca has already commented, uh, if you run a secondary assay by employing a different technology, as for example, the C uh, part of the picture, uh, that is a luminescent 
uh, assay, of course, these autofluorescence compounds are removed from there, so these false positives are clearly identified. But there's still some warnings with this aggregation or this component specific compound. So it's always good to have your chemical laboratory bio profile in order to properly know what are the characteristics of your compounds in there. If you move to the next slide. And last but not least is also to make a proper compound logistics. Um, usually the most common procedure to store a chemical laboratory is keep the compounds frozen at minus 20 degrees in, in 384 well plates or 1536 depending on the throughput of, of your facility. But in this paper that is from more than 10 years ago, is uh, is as the the author showed the difference between having the compounds just in a lidded plate in the top and in a sealed plate. When the different colors in blue means the quantity of water that is uh, uh, catching the DMSO. The compounds are dissolved at 10 millimolar in DMSO. DMSO is hygroscopic, so it's attracting water. And you may realize that in the in the corners of the plate you can be modifying the percentage of water up to a 50%, 15%. So the quantity of compound there, the concentration has, has been changed, but also there could be some hydrolysis there and, or there could be some precipitation. Instead, if you use a seal plate, you can see that the moisture catching is quite homogeneous in, in the whole plate. Furthermore, you have to avoid the freeze saw cycle. As much uh, times you throw your plate, uh, the, the more water is, is attracting the DMSO. So you can see in the, in the bottom of the screen on the left, when the compounds were stored at four degrees, that the uh, DMSO is frozen at this temperature. When you screen them by the fifth time, the purity of the compounds had decreased up to a 50%. And in the sixth time, up to a six, more than a 60%. So this is critical because when you are finding some results there, you are not finding results on your compounds, you are finding compound results on your impurity. So it's better to keep the compounds even at room temperature storage as on the right, but under inert conditions, as an example, a nitrogen current or, or some kind of environmental control that avoids attracting this, this water uptake. So with this is just to summarize you the relevance of having your proper compound chemical collection, but also managing them in a proper way. And we can move to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Pepo. May I ask Shiraz to continue? Please, Shiraz. Okay, thank you very much, Saka. So my name is Shiraz Gul. I am from the Fraunhofer Institute of Molecular Biology and Ecology, and I am head of assay development and screening in Hamburg in Germany. So I will cover the main topics in terms of assay op optimization, pilot and primary screening. So we've already heard from the previous two speakers, various assay types which are required for screening and also the compound library compositions as well. In terms of the assay development, there are three types of assays which are often used for screening. And this includes phenotypic assays where we often do not know the molecular target which we are um, investigating. And then there are biochemical assays where we have the purified molecular target and then a cell-based assay where it's a halfway house between a biochemical and a phenotypic assay where we have some sort of reporter system, either, for example, luciferase reporter or GFP or some antibody detection looking at the molecular target within the cell. Most of the assays that we use for screening are developed in microtiter plate. And in terms of screening, once we expose our assays to compounds and we find our primary hits, these we do not often know the mode of action. And this is all the deconvolution work that is done afterwards. And ideally, we want to find compounds which are genuine modulators of our target, which might be activators, inhibitors, allosteric binders, and so on. But a large proportion of compounds could also be acting via a non-specific way. For example, aggregators, they could be optically interfering. For example, absorbance-based assays are very prone to optical interference. Fluorescence-based assays are less prone to optical interference. And luciferase reporter assays are even less prone to um, optical interference. 
There could also be a possibility that there is some low level contaminant within your compound, which is the reason why you are seeing some activity. And then when you do repeat studies with a fresh batch of compound, it, it could be that the activity disappears. And this might be down to the fact that the sample that you originally used in the screen contains some low level contamination. Ultimately, we would have a good data set, which would be our final validated hits, where we can be confident that the compounds are acting in a desired manner on the target of interest, and then they will be further optimized to deliver a lead compound for protection via a patent, and then move into animal model studies. The next slide, please. Most of the assays that we develop for screening purposes are based in microtiter plates, and this could be in 96 well, 384 well, and 1536 well as well. And all of these formats are used routinely for biochemical and cell-based assays. For imaging-based assays, the microtiter plates often have a clear bottom, so you can actually use a microscope to image the cells through the plates. And if you are using an absorbance-based assay, that may well also use a plate with a clear bottom. For fluorescence-based assays, TR FRET, Alpha Screen, uh, Lucifer's Reporter, you will use, say, a particular colored plate, white or black, and that doesn't necessarily need to be see-through from, from the bottom. The advantage of biochemical assays are that as you have the purified target in isolation, we know the absolute concentration of the target. We can dose in substrate at a particular concentration. We can actually do kinetics of substrate turnover and do quantitative studies, including potency determination of compounds, and as part of the workflow before we do screening is to ensure that the assay is tolerant to DMSO as the compounds that we use for screening are often dissolved in DMSO. And as part of the final workflow is to check the day-to-day -day variability and plate-to-plate -plate variability of the assay. The assay in terms of a reference compound, which is used to benchmark an assay that should be consistent within a day and also within a plate-to-plate -plate basis. With a cell-based assay, as we often do not know how much protein target has been expressed, there is a limited number of mechanistic studies that we can do with a cell-based assay. However, both are complementary. Often with a drug discovery project, you would probably want to have a biochemical and cell-based assay in parallel, and then you can confirm the activity with the hits in both assays and, and understand the mode of action of the compounds. Once you have your assay and which is robust and reliable and you have a standard operating procedure, this is often done in a manual format or a semi-automated fashion. You can then transfer the assay to a high throughput screening robot if you are screening lots of compounds. And once you've done the screen, your initial hits, which might be activators, inhibitors, you would then have to pick those compounds again and do confirmation studies. This is essentially a repeat of the primary screen, but only with the primary hits. And once you have you've got your final confirmed hits, depending on the assay that you've used in the screen, you will probably want to run a counter assay where you would try and determine and prove that the observation is not some sort of assay specific artifact. For example, with Absorbance-based assays, if a compound is very colored, that may well absorb some of the light from the assay and give a false positive. So a suitable counter-assay needs to be developed, and all the confirmed hits should be screened in the counter-assay to ensure that the activity that you are observing is real and not some artifact. And then final progression is to run some sort of secondary assay this is often a cell-based assay, which is more physiologically relevant, but looking at the same activity of the target, but in a different system. And you would expect a real modulator of your target of interest should be active in the primary assay and also the secondary assay. Next slide, please. In terms of assays, I already mentioned that there are 96-fold assays, 
384 and 1536. Each of those has its advantages and disadvantages, and there really is no right and wrong in terms of assay plate density. If your assay is low throughput and you are only screening a small number of compounds, then a 96 well assay is fine. If you are screening hundreds of thousands of compounds, then you might want to miniaturize the assay into 1536 well format. But the bulk of um, researchers involved in drug discovery, they tend to screen in 384 well format because this seems to be a good compromise in terms of throughput, cycle time, and also the fact that you don't need to invest too much in terms of very sophisticated liquid handling and plate readers. And the table at the bottom shows the plate density, the number of plates, and the assay volume and the total reagent com consumption for a 100,000 compound screen with no dead volume. And really, there are diminishing returns when you miniaturize the assay from 384 to 1536-fold format as the assay volume often goes down from 10 microliters to just under 10, but you can try and push it down to five microliters. So unless your reagent is very expensive, uh, you might find that the 384 well assay format is a good compromise and where you will not use too much reagent. Uh, next slide. This marker library screen in terms of a pilot project, this is often only done when you are intending to do a screen of 50,000 or more compounds. If you are doing a, say, a five or 10,000 compound screen, you may well just go straight into the screen without doing a pilot screen to validate the assay um, because time is money and it may well be quick enough just to screen the entire library if it's a few thousand compounds. However, when you are screening 50,000 or more compounds, it is prudent to take a subset of the library, typically 1%, and then screen that subset in duplicate to get an idea on the performance of the screen, the performance of the assay. And then if you need to make some adjustments, you can do that before you embark on the expensive screen itself. This slide shows a summary of a 250,000 compound screen that we eventually did. So we picked just over 1% of compounds, which was in this case 2,760 compounds, and we screened them in duplicate in our primary assay and the frequency distribution plot on the top left at 10 micromolar is what you'd expect. Most of the compounds are largely inactive, which is the purple line, and our two um, controls, which are the DMSO, gave 0% inhibition, and our reference control which is the light blue colors on the right-hand side gives 100% inhibition. So the frequency distribution plot is good. You can see there are telltale signs of some optical interference. There are many hits which are coming up with very large negative inhibition and also some com compounds which are giving very large positive inhibition as well. These are very likely to be artifacts of the system, but we will come onto that in the next few slides. And then you can see the frequency distribution plot on the, on the left-hand side and the correlation between the two data sets. Looking at the data by eye, this is a very good correlation between the two data sets. There will always be some outliers, and this is typical of screening, but very good correlation. And you can again see the two tails, which are giving very large negative inhibition and also very large positive inhibition. The bottom left are the plates from the marker library screen, which was done in 384 well format and the Z prime. For biochemical assays, we typically try and have a minimum of 0.6 Z prime. For cell-based assays, as they are often more tricky and more difficult and, and less sensitive, and the signal window is lower, we can aim for a minimum Z prime of 0.5. But this is something that you need to decide as a team what is a suitable Z prime for progression of the project. And the table at the bottom right shows an, a detailed analysis of the marker library screen at different percentage cutoff for selecting apparent hits. And just to add some extra value, what we did here was we screened the marker library at three concentrations, five micromolar, 10 micromolar, and 20 micromolar. And you can clearly see as you increase the compound concentration, the number of hits go up. And as you increase the percentage cutoff, the number of hits go down. 
So this table was used to decide what concentration of compound to use in the screen and also what could be a reasonable percentage cutoff. For most screening activities, we try and aim for a hit, a hit um, rate of roughly 1%. However, this is chosen and decided upon on a case-by-case -case basis with your whole team. So in this case, we decided to screen a five micromolar and try and aim for a 50% cutoff as an apparent hit. This still gives us a 3% hit rate, which is more than what we want to aim for, but it gives us enough chemical matter if we need to go back into and pick more hits if some of the compounds fail to progress, we've got enough chemical matter as backup compounds. Uh, next slide, please. Having done the primary screen from the marker library scaled up to 250,000 compounds, there are lots of ways in um, normalizing the data and deciding what should be categorized as a hit compound as whatever you decide to do then will really dictate how the project progresses. If you only pick hits which are from one scaffold and then you confirm them, you really are limiting the progression of the project. So there are lots of ways in normalizing the data. And the simplest way is to just simply select a particular percentage threshold as a cutoff. However, this is really not the right way to do things. You really need to get medicinal chemistry input, input from your team, input from public databases, Kemble, PubChem, Drug Bank, uh, PubMed, and really annotate the hits that you have already. This can all be done in silico and then decide which compounds to actually pick for your further study. As if you cut corners here or do not a for a job that will really have a significant impact on, on downstream activities. And often what you want to do is have exemplars from different scaffolds. You want to make sure that the compounds that you pick and progress are from multiple chemotypes. That gives you enough space as some of the chemotypes will not progress further through the drug discovery cascade. So you can deprioritize them and then prioritize other scaffolds. Uh, next slide, please. So having done the 250,000 compound screen, we did our triaging and hit selection, and then we picked roughly 2,500 compounds. So we did aim for a 1% hit rate eventually for confirmation studies, but we were aware that we do have some backup hit compounds, which we can pick quickly if none of these compounds which are shown on this slide actually progress. So you always have something as a backup strategy just in case that's needed. This is a duplicate study of the confirmation of the 2,500 hits that we picked, n equals 1 versus n equals 2. And all of these compounds gave in the primary screen a 50% cutoff, which is shown in the green box. And you can see there are a number of compounds which do not replicate. This is typical. Not every compound will give a reproducible activity of 100%. So there will always be some compounds which will not confirm. If you have a confirmation rate of 50% or above, that is acceptable. If you have a confirmation rate of 10 or 20%, this, is, this really indicates that the screen did not perform well. So this is the output from the confirmation screening where we pick the hits and this reconfirm the activities and the bulk of the con activities are confirmed. And next slide, please. And then you would run a secondary assay just to check that the compounds are active in a secondary screen. And then you would do dose response studies at a range of concentrations and determine the absolute potency of the compounds. We know theoretically dose response curves should be nice and sigmoid. They should have a nice slope factor of one. You should have a minimum and a maximum of between zero and 100%. In reality, screening gives a very dirty output. Some compounds, as you can see on the bottom row on the right hand side, the third compound from the left, that's giving a reasonable hill slope and a reasonable signal window. However, 
as you can see in the top row on the left hand side, there are some compounds which will only give partial curves. If you have sophisticated software, which can analyze dose responses and remove outliers, which you can see in the top left hand curve, software is available, which will automatically analyze dose response curves and give curve fitting and give estimates for IC50 determinations. All this is possible. You can do some of these activities in Excel or Graph Pad Prism. But when you are dealing with high throughput screening on an industrial scale, where you have 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 dose response curves, fitting them manually is too time consuming. So, next slide. And the ultimate endpoint for this project, where we have screened 250,000 compounds, we have a data package where we have done our primary screen, we've done our secondary screen and our confirmation and our dose response studies. And we have a data package of a few hundred compounds with nice looking dose response curve. And you can see some screenshots on the top right hand side. And this is our final validated hit list. These are compounds which we are confident are modulators of our target of interest. And the potencies are typically in the single digit micromolar region. And this data package will ideally contain compounds from different scaffolds. And then the members of the team will pick up these compounds and then progress certain scaffolds in the hit lead stage, which will involve optimization of the potencies, reducing off target effects and so on, and other parameters which are typical required for lead compounds. The next slide. So our final validated hit list will contain compounds where we have typically IC50s of less than 10 micromolar in our, against our target of interest. As we can relatively easily get some selectivity profiling done, Profiling a small number of compounds, maybe exemplars from each scaffold in a panel of selectivity assays should be done to get an idea on selectivity. There are also what we call anti-targets, those drug targets which we should not inhibit because they are required for biological processes and profiling exemplars in the uh, anti-targets should, should also be done. Before we actually hand over our data package to our team members, we need to confirm that the activities are real, and this should be done from a fresh sample of compound, either purified from your stock, or you resynthesize, or you repurchase a fresh solid sample, and the compound activity should be retained. As you have got scaffolds, there should be some structure activity relationship apparent from the analogs, there should be no obvious undesirable chemical features within the compounds and some physical chemical properties should also be determined. And much of this can be done in silico methodology. Right, next slide. That's where I end and then I will hand over to Pepo to continue. Okay, thank you, Shiraz. Francisca, can I ask you to continue briefly with the data analysis? Thank you. Okay. The last part of this introduction course is, is related to the data analysis. Uh, the, there are some parameters to, to, that need to be evaluated the, control, the quality control of the assay, and some of them are described here in this, this slide. To, man, to evaluate the control, the quality control is very important in the case of the analysis uh, to be sure that the, as the results that we are obtaining and the data that we obtain are robust and then we are uh, obtain a very good uh, outcome of the assay that we are performing. The, one of the, these parameters is the SETA factor. The SETA factor is measure the robustness of the assay, is measure this uh, robustness uh, plate by plate and should be over uh, 0.5 or higher and if in this set of factors evaluated the standard deviation of the sample, the controls, the mean of the samples, and the mean of the control. This uh, parameter uh, is 
if it's not uh, uh, reach the zero my, my uh, higher of 0 0.5 for each plate is this means that we don't we don't should consider this plate as a valid of the, our com campaign and then we don't uh, consider this and we need to, to repeat this one uh, this is something that is uh, very important when we evaluate it and we do a large uh, campaign of, of screening Another factor is the, is the coefficient of the variation, and we are we measure the dispersion of of, of our of our of our acid and of the result of, of the heat of the we obtain the result that we obtain in each plate and each in the campaign. These factors or these these parameters should be evaluated plate per plate, interplate and interplate. And uh, finally, the third quality parameter that is very important is to evaluate the signal background and the signal, signal noise. And this is to measure if it strengths our assay or if it's not strengths our assay. These three ones always should be maintained in quality. If, we don't, if some of them is not uh, worthy and is not working well, it's, so, uh, we should think that maybe happen some problem with our asset or with our plate, with the plate that we are will obtain these results. And then we don't need, we could not consider this one for, for our uh, campaign and we need to confirm or to repeat this, this plate. In the next slide is only uh, going to explain some specific uh, characteristics of the CETAR parameter. There are some advances in, in the setter parameter because it's taking a plate per plate and then we give us the noise or level for each plate. That is very good because it, is, it gives us an idea of all of the plates of the RAM of, that we are uh, uh, performed in, in one day are, uh, could be considered or only we could say uh, some of the plates but not for, for this run. And, uh, in, in this case, he, he try to avoid the the, contour, the the problems that we have in, in consider if we consider all of the run as, as is something that is is completely uh, good. But the advantage is that sometimes is, in, when we evaluate the plate, we evaluate it all of the samples that are in the plate, and then we evaluate the strengths of the plate. And but. And, and the strength of the plates sometimes give us the problems of the issues that we have some border effects. And this border effect uh, is uh, something that is very common in some assays. And this advance could be an advance because if we have this kind of problems, uh, it's giving us that the robustness of our asset is not good. And then we have, we have to evaluate it, this evaporation of this effect that we have in the borders. Or maybe we cannot put, if we cannot solve this, we cannot consider the samples that are in the border of the plates, and then we need to avoid this, this number of wells that are in the, in, the, in, the, in the plates. Moving to the next slide, please. Now, before to, to, to establish the readout of the assays, we need to establish the layout. This means the layout of the of the plate is the definition of how we want to distribute the samples in, in a plate. This is in a plate of 96, but could be in a plate of 384, like Sarah uh, mentioned before, or even even higher. Uh, and in, in each place will be the controls, positive and negative controls, in this position that is described here, but also could be in the middle of the plate, could be in, in some of the columns, could be, we try to, is, uh, to, uh, try to, to avoid the borders of the plate, because if we have some uh, effect border, it is uh, control should be here and then give us some, some uh, problems when we evaluate it all of the samples and when we, eval uh, we determine the parameters that we mentioned before, like the set factor of the coefficient of, of variation. Uh, all of the, the uh, ones that we define this plate layout, all of the data that we obtain from this plate layout are allowed, up, up, allowed in, the, in the database. And at the same time, in the next slide, please, is described another 
topic, another point that is very important uh, to, be, to take in consideration that is asset plate creation, which will merge the distribution of the sample in the plates with the information that we have of each, 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 each sample. And we will merge this in, in, in an automated process. If we, there are different limbs that could be do this. Also, we can develop an internal uh, program on internal um, process to do this, but this when we run a big campaigns with a high number of, 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 of samples, this is very useful and it's very important. This is in order to try to avoid SS files. SS files could be useful when uh, the number of campaigns that you run is too small, but when you run more than 100,000 samples, in, in a campaign and in, in different targets at the same time, you should to try to do this in an automated process and to merge it, the samples with the results in, in an automated process uh, using different um, systems that are available uh, in, in the market. And in this next slide, is an description that uh, the things that you obtained from the different instruments where you do the readout of the samples, we call this raw data, and this raw data and transforming and loading in, in this data in different graphs or on different plots. Many of them were mentioned before, and you see this kind of graph and plots for, for Serat, and, uh, and, and the sample that is here in the, in the, in the right of the of the of the slides is a represent part of representable of one plate where you see the values, the raw data values, and at the same time you can establish uh, uh, different colors uh, and then and these colors could give you the positives and the negatives and the, this scale of colors give you which one and it's more visual and at the same time like um, presented uh, set up, uh, this can be transformed in, in a dosage response or can be transformed in, in, in different curves, dosis, uh, dosis curve, um, do, uh, um, different curve, uh, dosis curves. And to obtain or to come do this in, in, a, in graphs and in plots is very important because give gives you from the point of view and the first view of one are the the most, the hits that you have, the selection of hits, and what are the other things that for the large number of compost that you are obtaining that are not important, and this is a selection. Also, there are many, many tools to do this, and some are uh, free, and others are different process to do this in, in an automatic uh, system. Uh, the automatic systems avoid errors, and avoid uh, to have maybe some results that, uh, the, that at the end are not a good one and they to, to, uh, the only thing that you are is to lose time and to, to identify some hits that are many are maybe not the right one. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is my final slide uh, before we pass to the next step of, of the courses is in this slide, I would like to summarize more or less the scale factors to have as a source of the HTS. Uh, there are three point, main topics that we mentioned from all of the HTS course. One is the quality. It's very important to maintain the quality of the HTS process. It's very important to take in consideration, to take in account the time. The time in the wells, the time in the dells, in the screening, in the project, and also the last, the last part on the last leg or leg of this uh, success to, to obtain the success of the, the, this HTS is the cost. Uh, also, this this um, topic was mentioned uh, by by Seraf in the presentation and in, in taking in consideration the type of, of screening that we are using. Uh, this is more important or, or less important. Uh, with all of this that we presented, uh, I think, and with these two, three point factors, we give you a 
general presentation and a clear idea of some of the critical tools that uh, can be used in the HTS strategies that give us the possibility to obtain some successful results to detect drugs that we could use later for the treatment of the important disease and obtain like the such of one of the current affecting to the, world, to the whole of the world that we are suffer. This is very important to learn these things that we are trying to, to mention during this course and very useful for the success of all of the assets of the science in general. And with this, uh, I finish the, pre the presentation. Okay, thank you, Francisca. I will try to, to run the video. Okay, I'm able to run the video and I would like to ask Beppo to comment the video which was prepared in his uh, site. Beppo, please. Thank you, Sarka. Uh, this video is just uh, a brief illustration of how high throughput screening campaigns are run. So in this video, you can you can see how the compounds are already prepared and uh, they are diluted in order to obtain the desired concentration for running the campaign. Uh, when, with this dilution, it is better always to have a single step where you can add all the reagents needed if it's possible to the compounds and they not then move it to a liquid handling system that is going to add the compounds onto the cells for, uh, for, from where we are going to measure the, the, the effect of the compounds. So the compounds are moved to the liquid handler and everything as you may see is fully automated in order to be processing several plates at a time and the cells are taken out from the incubator and the robotic arm is going to take the, the plate with the cells from this incubator and move it to the liquid handler. So once the, the cells are on the liquid handler, the liquid handler takes out the lid of the plate. And once the lid is removed, it's able to aspirate the compounds from the source plate and dispense the compounds into the cells. As you may see, all the plates are barcode labeled in order that the system is able to follow the process for each of the plates in this assay. And at the end, all the readout that you are obtaining at the reader is uh, classified according to this barcode. So now once the compounds were added into the cells, the, the robotic arm is going to remove the compounds from the, from the liquid handler and uh, return it to the source where these compounds were located, and then take the cells from the liquid handler and put them into the incubator where they are going to be incubated for the required time and at the required temperature, depending on the assay you have previously developed, uh, in order to observe the effect of the compounds on the, on the plate. As you may see, the robotic arm is moving all the, the plate with the cells up to the incubator that is at 37 degrees in this case and 5% CO2. As everything is fully automated, several assay plates are running parallel. Each of these uh, blue bars are belonging to a given plate. So the system escalates them in time in order to avoid that any plate is incubating for a longer time than any other. And once the incubation time is finished, the robotic arm introduces the plane into the reader. The reader reads the barcode and the readout is carried out and all the data obtained is fully stored in a, in a, a, say in a file format that can be easily integrated into the databases as Francisca showed and the, from there you can uh, easily review and obtain those response curves and review those response curves, validated the compounds, etc. So this is just a brief summary of how the high throughput screening campaigns are run 
of course, it is something a little bit more complicated, but this is just to give you a, a brief flavor of uh, how are these campaigns run. So with this, I finish, Saka. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pepo. Now I will stop the, the recording of the webinar and we, we can continue with some questions.